My talk today is about depression, the first visit in primary care, and this was put together by myself, Chris Dorick from Liverpool, a Wing Chin from University of Hong Kong, and that's up on the Wonka website. It's, uh, and then Fiona Moyer, who's going to be speaking later today, shortened it down for the British Journal of General Practice. Um, of all the hundreds of things I've written in my life, this is the one I feel most pleased about, actually. So I'm really delighted to be talking about it. But just to, um, a, a short commercial break. So we're, we're working with the college, um, and uh, this is us. So we've got the Goodfellow Symposium. It'll be going up this week, um, 23rd to the 25th of March. We're having a pre-conference day now with surgical options, dermoscopy, uh, mental health. Uh, so there's a whole lot of things happening before that. Um, we have our online e-learning, so if you need CME points, CPD points, then there's lots of online learning there. Uh, there's the gyms, so these are, um, someone described them as quirky, which I thought was, I felt really tickled, because they come out of my brain, um, essentially. So I'm searching about uh, 15 knowledge, what I call knowledge refineries to find the gyms. So there's quite a high threshold, so it has to be practice changing. And this one was quite interesting because in 2011, I saw my GP with a wheezy chest and he put me on some prednisone and my wife got me to walk on Mount Eden and I slipped down a bank and my ankle went from north-south to east-west painlessly and I actually had to have a, uh, a pin put in it. And I, I thought, this is really odd, I've done some pretty heavy-duty tramping in my life. I've done the, uh, the um, not the heavy track, the one on the South Island, the really heavy-duty one. Never even sprained an ankle, and there I am with a fractured ankle uh, completely apart. And I wondered if it was a steroid. So um, the numbers needed to harm are about, you have to treat 800 patients to cause a fracture. But this was actually in um, low-risk people, so people under the age of 65. So it may be more of a problem. So I actually now tell people when I put them on steroids to not go jogging or walk on, on unstable ground. The risks of sepsis were much higher, like 3,000, I think, people you had to treat. So it's not a big risk, but it's just something to think about. Um, so hopefully you enjoy getting those. Uh, these are our podcasts. So this is one on workplace bullying. And there's some other ones, um, a podcast on men who have sex with men, oral cancer, neck lumps. Uh, Marion Roberts is speaking today. So uh, if you want to know how to put them onto your mobile phone, um, there's uh, instructions on how to do it, or if, if you're not sure, I'd be happy to show you how to do it at morning tea time. Uh, our podcasts are often number one in the Asia-Pacific region, ahead of the Lancet and BMJ, and Rob Sheaf, who's our next speaker, has done one for us. So um, they're very meaty, and um, I always say to people, don't complain about the Auckland traffic, listen to podcasts. Um, so these are the webinars we've done. We've got one coming up next Tuesday on preventing falls-related injuries. Uh, I did one with David Menkes on antidepressants in primary care. So if you're, if you're live on a webinar, you can ask questions. And we're now trying to answer all the questions on the night. So a shorter talk, cases, and then answering the questions. Um, but, there's, uh, but they're recorded also, so you can go back and watch those. The only downside with the recorded version is you can't see, uh, you can't ask questions. And this is our um, YouTube channel, so if you go to YouTube and put in Goodfellow Unit, you find the webinars are up there, that's Helen Fulcher, uh, Diana North, uh, interviewing various people, so there's lots of stuff there. I, I often say to people, it's never been easier to keep up to date than it is these days. I don't have any 20-year-old copies of Harrison's textbook of medicine on my shelf. I, I dive into the internet or, or scan documents. This is just the, um, one of the things that Christine McIntosh and the team are keen to push is the Auckland Pathways. There's a whole lot of mental health ones there. And the username and passwords are... Um, so if you don't know those, um, they're actually commercially secret, so you're not allowed to tell anybody, but uh, are the names. So, um, so that's because it was, uh, they're owned originally by, the, by Canterbury. So there's a whole lot there. Um, yeah, so the, the, uh, if you want to look at this talk in Arabic, Mandarin, or Portuguese, you can go to the Wonka website. Um, um, I've talked. I've, I've used the term depression, but I have to say, the more I do of mental health and general practice, the less able I am to distinguish 
depression from anxiety. Um, I do a PHQ-9, a GAD-7 on pretty well all, all my patients who've got mental health problems or distressed, and they always score <clears throat> something on both of them. If they're more sort of anxious, the, the GAD score tends to be higher than the PHQ-9, but um, I have to say, somebody I think is very depressed will often get better in three or four weeks, which I wouldn't have normally expected. But, you know, this is no surprise to you, although the numbers maybe. This is from Wellington, this is from Tony Dow's study in the early 2000s, but I don't think it's changed. And this was um, at a DSM-4 level. So that's, that's for whatever you think of the DSM, um, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of the American Psychiatric Association. Um, it's quite a high threshold. So there's lots of stuff, and I often like to say um, it's often the, the anxiety or distress that drives people to see us. If you've got back pain and life is going well, you may not go and see your GP. But if you've got back pain and you start to think, I've got cancer and I'm a bit anxious, and, um, and so it's often the, final, the mental health thing is often the final common pathway. This is from our own work. So PHQ-9 greater than 9, so that's moderate supposedly a moderate level of depression, 12.9% of people over the previous two weeks. And this is one of the points I make, because we now give this talk to the medical students, and they actually quite like it for, them, for themselves and their families. Interesting that they haven't quite got the hang that we're actually training them for patients, but, um, but uh, the, the feedback we've got is they quite like some of the techniques we um, explain to them. Um, and I tell them it can be very satisfying. I'm sure you've all had experience of taking somebody who's really you know, flat as a pancake and you work with them and follow through and you talk and, and do whatever, and they end up getting that vitality back. I mean, it's hugely satisfying, I think. Um, but I have to say, I wouldn't have got that impression from my medical school training. And whichever way you look at it, depression or anxiety, it's very common in primary care. And it's um, <clears throat> really a problem with younger people. Um, when I talk to the medical students, they think it's all the oldies who are, who are depressed and anxious, but actually, um, and this may be a different cohort, of course. These people have had a different life experience. They would have, uh, some of them would have gone through wars and uh, the depression and things like that when the study was done in 2003. But if you see young people, if you work in student health, you realize these figures are absolutely massive. In general practice, if you see a 20-year-old woman there's a 40% chance she's got an anxiety condition, a diagnosable anxiety condition. So if they've got a headache, I wouldn't be looking for the brain tumour, I'd be looking for, for what's going on in their lives. Uh, so that's a 12-month prevalence, so it's pretty massive. Um, and it's sort of worldwide, so this is looking at lifetime prevalence of depression. Um, the New Zealand studies are different, this is from, these are from a different study, so it depends what instrument do you use to measure this? And maybe something's lost in translation because there's a high suicide rate in Japan. But of course, these questionnaires don't necessarily um, translate over. And this was from Mark Oakley Brown, uh, the uh, 2006 study. This is from 2003. So, um, and it seems like the developing world is drifting um, uh, into mental health and drug addiction problems. You know, we're getting on top of chronic diseases and mental health and drug addiction problems are becoming, becoming the issue. So this is the problem we face every day, isn't it? Patients don't walk into us and say, I'm depressed or anxious. I mean, sometimes they do, and that's easy. Because I'm often, often talking to psychologists about acceptance and commitment therapy. And of course, by the time you go and see a psychologist, it's a nice package diagnosis. At least you're distressed and you come and see, see somebody and you want to talk about it. We've got the problem of somebody coming with chest pain, headache, back pain, and then having to convert that to, prime, uh, to, to a mental health diagnosis or, or consultation if we need to. Anywhere from 45 to 95 percent of patients who are depressed will present with uh, a physical symptom, not a psychological symptom. Uh, and then there's this. This is the tough group, of course, and I'm sure you've all had that situation when you start to delve into their into their psyche and their social world. Um, they can start getting a bit twitchy. And just remember that the quality of life of somebody who has a depression. <clears throat> is that of, of somebody on renal dialysis. So they're going to feel really unwell. And I can remember a man, be about 20 years ago, before the John Kerwin stuff, and I think the John Kerwin stuff has transformed 
been able to deal with men now, or else I've got better at saying men are depressed, one or the other, probably a bit of both. Um, and he just insisted, he was clearly depressed, he just kept saying, I want more tests, I want a scan, I want more blood tests, I want to see somebody, I want to do things. And we finally got, got him to see a psychiatrist and he accepted that he was depressed. And I don't seem to see that so much these days, but that, that thing, I think that highlighted to me that this guy was feeling physically very unwell. Um, and even though his physical body was fine, he was a fireman, I think, he was actually in pretty good shape. So there are ways of getting into depression. You can get in by the black door if you want to. You can ask about the, the more physical things. Um, but then at some point you have to get into guilt, moods, enjoyment, and suicidal thoughts. So, um, so, that's, uh, so that's, that's the DMS4 starting with the physical side and then moving over. Um, I try and raise the possibility, I guess I've learned over the years to raise the possibility, because of the high prevalence of what we're seeing, uh, raise the possibility very early on. For example, the classic, of course, is the patient with um, fatigue. Uh, you want to know what's going on. I'll, I'll show you quite a good, I'll, I'll show you the rule out questions for that. Um, and that can be a bit stressful sometimes. But the problem is if you, st if you don't raise the psychosocial at the beginning and you sort of, the blood tests come back all normal and everything's looking okay, then you've got to then raise the issue of psychological stuff, which of course can be difficult if it's not brought up early. Um, I do a PHQ-9 fairly regularly in our clinic. Um, and I have to say, I find patients own it, having filled it in. I'll say, your score says, um, and I don't normally get, well, you know, that's wrong because they've filled it in. So I think there's a little bit of self-education that goes on with, with, a, with a PHQ-9 uh, when, when they do that. Um, I, I do a little bit of work with McGill University in Canada, and they find people with very high PHQ-9s are less likely to depress. And I've often found that people who tick all the right-hand boxes often have personality disorders. So if someone ticks the whole right-hand side, just think about that. Um, it, it's a little rule of thumb. I don't. I, it's not diagnostic, but there's usually something else going on. Um, uh, anyway, so why do, why do clinicians um, uh, avoid the mental health. Um, this was again from the Wellington group. Um, it, was, it was a paper called The Glorious Twilight of Uncertainty, because that's what one of the respondents had, had said. The problem was psychological stuff. It's this glorious twilight of uncertainty, which I thought uh, a very Tony Dowlish sort of uh, title for a paper. Um, well, what, one of the things is, is the fear of Pandora's box, but um, what lies at the bottom of Pandora's box is hope. So once you get all the, 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 the nasty things out, there's hope at the bottom. So I, I, would, I would subscribe to that, that we shouldn't be afraid of Pandora's box. And um, there is the issue of stigma, and I'll tell you in a moment how I get around that. A low energy of the clinician, will that affect us all from time to time? And uh, Fiona Moyer will be talking to us uh, about this. This is a question, I know when we developed the screening questions for depression, um, and it is an issue, of course, you know, you break up with your boyfriend or girlfriend at, two, at um, 22 years of age and then you go and you get a mortgage and you want to get insurance and suddenly depression's in your notes and the insurance company bumps up your, um, your, your fees. And I mean, how accurately could we say that patient at 22 was depressed? Uh, and I think that's, um, uh, that's, that's, uh, that's an informant. Uh, clinicians not liking mental health, well, I think um, we're clearly not talking to those people today because you wouldn't be here. Um, and I think mental health is fascinating. Uh, we're all trained a little bit to do the physical first, and that's still an issue with the medical students. They're still very Cartesian, you know, it's either in your body or in your head. Um, and as we reminded um, them the other day, I was talking to David Minkies, I think there's more serotonin in the gut than in the brain. Is that right, Rob? Something like that? Yeah. Um, so, you know, the, the body is one massive electrical system. Um, and then being unskilled in raising mental health, well, hopefully uh, with today's topics you, you'll be right in there. Um, and this is a great quote from Glenn Cahoon, which I'm, which I'm sure, let's let you read it for a moment. Um, it's, in, it's in Hamish Wilson and, and Wayne Cunningham's book on being a doctor. It is a fantastic book. They wrote it about their sort of 30 years uh, 
uh, experience in primary care. And it's the only place I think Glenn's written that, actually, but it is. It's very Kalhuni. Um, so these are the good rule out questions. So have you felt depressed down or hopeless for all or most of the past month? And have you lost interest or pleasure in all or most activities for most of the past month? So this is a bit like a BNP. It's very sensitive. So if somebody says no to those two, they're probably not depressed. So if somebody came in and was fatigued, say an 18-year-old comes in very fatigued, then you might want to look at perhaps glandular fever might be, might be an option if they said no. So I think if someone says no to those two things, you might want to start hunting in the biomedical domain rather than the psychosocial. If they say yes to either of those, it could be a false positive. So that's always a problem with, uh, with these questions. Uh, so then I would do a PHQ-9 or a hospital anxiety depression scale. Some of you may use a BDI, that's the BIC, but you suppose you're supposed to pay $5 every time you use that, so that's a bit of... Or the Kessler. I don't think it matters. What we're measuring here really is distress, not depression or anxiety. It's really distress in people. <coughs> and this is from the UK data, and our data would sort of confirm it. Um, the cut point is 10 and then 15 and then 20, but actually a score greater than 12 uh, means you should be offering uh, active treatment. But that doesn't mean drugs. And I'm going to talk about um, whether or not to give drugs at the first visit in primary care, because I, um, I don't think that's a good idea. So here are some numbers. So this is from our own work. This is 2,642 patients. And they did a PHQ-9. And that's the PHQ-9 uh, range there, mild, moderate, moderate to severe, severe. And then people got a gold standard computerized, uh, so they got a diagnosis of depression based on a computerized interview. Uh, so these people were depressed and these people weren't depressed. So the key thing to note here is you can have a very high PHQ-9 score and actually not be depressed. You're more likely to be depressed. 1.4% of people are depressed uh, versus 0.4. But, um, and I think this is important because these scores, the patient will come and see you on the first visit and have a very high score. Uh, a bit of love and attention and care and reframing and focusing and, and uh, a bit of hope. And these scores can come rocketing down. I just saw a lady this week whose score was 22 last week and we got her re-engaged with life. Literally, that's all we did. Got her seeing her friends doing things talking to her husband, and the score was four. So she went from severe to mild in the space of a week. And I have to say, I see that more often than I see people lingering up here. I mean, of course, if somebody lingers up here, that's a different sort of situation. The other thing to note here is that most people we see are in the mild to moderate range. And that's where antidepressants don't work. So most of the people we're seeing antidepressants are probably not working. And I'm sure you see that. We see people in our clinic that have been on antidepressants for years. They're still mild to moderately depressed. And, uh, but the, the, the tough thing is they often don't want to stop the medication. So clearly it's not working, but, but they don't want to stop it. It's sort of uh, the safety net. Um, so what's the value of a diagnosis? Well, I think there's, there's some movement in this area at the moment. The ICD are going to have a thing called mixed anxiety depression, uh, the Cochrane Depression, Anxiety and Neurosis Group, for want of an awful name, have now changed their name to Common Mental Disorders. And this, this term you'll start seeing, there was just a paper in JAMA Psychiatry a few weeks ago looking at children with a range of anxiety disorders and they used a transdiagnostic protocol. So they didn't have a separate one for PTSD, for social anxiety disorder, for generalised anxiety disorder, because all those, pro those CBT protocols are pretty similar. There's a massive overlap. And, you know, nobody really has an anxiety condition in isolation. There's usually other things going on and a bit of depression. And um, uh, So uh, in acceptance and commitment therapy, we use the term stuck. And we've actually put it into our med tech at Manurewa. So we've actually, so if you come and see me and you're distressed, then I'll give you a diagnosis of stuck. And almost everybody likes it, <laughs> almost everybody, because that's how they feel. Because when you're distressed, that's what, you know, when we are humans are distressed, we feel stuck. I did have one lady who told me off and um, she said, um, uh, how dare you say that to me? You're implying I'm not trying hard enough. I thought, no, I'm not, I'm just saying you're stuck. 
But anyway, she, she actually her problem was she thought she was seeing my partner in the clinic and she got to see me instead and I think she was a bit chagrined by that. He wasn't there that day. So. But she did thank me at the end, so we, we, did, we did pass, pass peacefully. But everybody else has said, yeah, I like that. You know, and wouldn't, wouldn't you rather have that on your insurance form than depressed or anxiety, you know? So I, I think you'll say trans, there's, a trend, there's been editorials in JAMA Psychiatry on transdiagnostic uh, um, stuff. So it is, it is a word you'll So there's transdiagnostic in terms of the diagnosis and then transdiagnostic in terms of the treatment. What's the value of a diagnosis? Well, essentially, if you're looking at anxiety and depression, the treatments are essentially the same. And um, Kirk Strosel, who'll be out here at the end of next month, and I'll just mention that before I finish, um, uh, would suggest you spend more, don't spend time on diagnosis, somebody's distressed, get on, find out what's going on, and get on with therapy. Because half the patients won't come back anyway. So if you don't get something, if you don't get something going, um, that's different if you're a psychologist or a psychiatrist different standards, then you might want to spend the first visit on, on a diagnosis, but in primary care, it's going to be mixed depression, anxiety, almost always get on with things. Um, so 60% of patients resolve in one year, um, and PHQ-9 scores are almost always lower at the next visit for a number of reasons. They've had a discussion of their symptoms, and then there's this great line out of Michael Bailent, the doctor as the drug. Now these days we would say the clinician is a drug because nurses uh, see patients as well in primary care. Um, and I think we must never underestimate the power of just spending some time with somebody and talking. You all would have seen this. You talk to somebody and they say that was just absolutely fantastic. People need somebody uh, to unload, a third party they can talk about their lives. We've done reframing, we've done normalisation, we've offered hope and support. And if nothing else, it's just old regression to the mean. High blood pressure today, it's going to be lower tomorrow. That's just how the biological world figures. Now, this is the NICE guidelines from the UK. They suggested lower levels of severity, which is much of what we're seeing. Um, Non-drug therapy, so CBT and computerised CBT. So we have access to beating the blues here. Uh, there's Mood Gym in Australia, which I understand now has got a charge to it. Um, Exercise, this is a recent study out of Sweden. Yoga and stretching were good. I mean, part of this is probably just getting out into life. I often say to patients uh, when, they're, when they're distressed, they're hiding in the back of the cave. And my job is to get them to expand their world and get out to the front of the cave, looking for lions to hunt um, and get out, getting out into the sunshine. And I think, uh, I have to say, the sort of behavioral activation, just getting people moving is just... Um, because everybody I see with a mental health problem has restricted some component of their work, love, or play. There'll be some deficit in, in those three domains. Uh, we also do problem solving. I mean, sometimes when people are in, uh, you know, their brains are full of worry and things, they can't see the forest or the trees. And sometimes, and I'm sure you've all done this, just saying to people, we'll do A, B, C, you know, break, break the problem down into, into a meaningful thing. So should we give drugs at the first visit? Well, one of the best bits of advice I was given um, uh, years ago from Tim Keneally, who many of you will know, uh, who was a GP in Papakura for many years, is not to give antidepressants at the first visit. This is in primary care. Different if you're a psychiatrist, because by that time people have gone through a filter, and uh, particularly if you're a psychiatrist in secondary care, it's probably appropriate at the first visit to always give, just about always give. We're interested to see what Rob Sheep has to say about that. Um, majority of patients in this group, or if they're severe, they're going to become mild to moderate. And I think we should try the non-drug first. Um, the uh, NICE guidelines suggest that um, if they've got a past history of moderate to severe depression persisting, then um, uh, we should consider um, uh, antidepressants or lower symptoms for most years. I'm going to show you in a minute actually how the problem with this, of course, is that, yep, the problem with this, of course, is their first reaction was probably a placebo response because most, most response to antidepressants in primary care is placebo. And here's the, the first bit of not so great news. This is the effect size in mild to moderate depression. Placebo response for SSRIs is 47%. Uh, this is from our own work, uh, the placebo rates. 6% um, active, 9%. Even up in the very severe, you're as likely to get a placebo response. It's 3 to 1 
um, uh, placebo response uh, up here um, for somebody getting better. And so this is an overestimate. So that may look a bit pathetic to you, but that's an overestimate. Because this is our systematic review in primary health care. You, you won't be used to seeing this. This is a thing called a fun plot. So on a Cochrane review, you can press a button and you get this graph. This is the size of study up here. And this is antidepressive effective, antidepressants not effective. This is antidepressants effective. With the big studies, they all cluster up the middle. Um, there are four small trials there showing antidepressants are effective. There are no small trials over there. So this is what we call publication bias. So what's happened to those four studies? Well, let's say I had done a randomized trial with not very many people because it's hard to recruit for these trials, and it showed no benefit. I'm not going to be able to get that published. That's going to be sitting in my bottom drawer. I don't happen to have one, but that's the sort of thing that happens in my life. I can't get this study published. I can get these published. Or it may have been the drug company. They, As you know, they'll do 10 studies and publish the two positive ones. So it might be in drug company investigators' drawers. Um, although nowadays you have to register things with the FDA. This is, this is from Irving Kirsch showing um, benefit versus severity. He got all the trials from the FDA and found, um, so this gets around publication bias. They only seem to work up here in the severe range. And interestingly, the placebo response drops in the severe range. So I like to think of that. Maybe it's becoming more a chemical depression up here. These are more sort of psychosocial depressions. 50% um, of pub trials aren't published. OK, so what are the harms of the drugs? They medicalize the condition. You're going to get a placebo response. And you, as a doctor, cannot tell. Even if you take it yourself, you can't tell. Patients credit the drugs themselves, adverse effect, risks of overdose. And I tell of the case when I was working in Lillooet, British Columbia in the 1980s. I gave a patient an antidepressant at about 5 o'clock at night. I asked if she was depressed. She said no. Next morning, she ended up in our little hospital. I was on call. I had to, I had to put a tube down her stomach and take my pills out of her stomach. She'd overdosed on my pills. We don't often have that privilege, if you like, of seeing that somebody else takes our pills out of our patient's stomachs. And I asked her, uh, I said, you weren't suicidal last night? She said, no, but my husband beat me up and I decided life wasn't worth living. So I would handed her a loaded gun, literally. That was the first visit too. So I wouldn't do that today, um, for sure. Um, it may, they may increase suicidality in teenagers. And antidepressants don't prevent suicide. Uh, that's, there's no evidence for that. And they're difficult to stop. So there's a withdrawal situation with the SSRIs where people get anxious um, and, they, they, and sweaty and they think the things are coming back. So when do the drugs work? Severe end of depression. Um, how you recognise this? Well, persisting PHQ-9. Or the patient not getting better. If they're struggling at work, I'm more inclined to give antidepressants. Um, maybe previous episodes. But remember, if they think the antidepressant isn't working, it probably never worked the first time. Their life has just become rotten again, and they've got depressed again. 12% uh, of New Zealanders are antidepressants. By my back of the envelope thing, maybe 3% of people are getting a biological benefit. That's, that's a rough guess. When to follow up? C is weekly at first. A week is a long time in a daily landscape. Three weeks are unimaginable. Uh, this paper is available. There's a podcast of this talk on our website. It's a great paper. Uh, Will Ferguson put me onto that. Uh, nurse phone call. We have uh, nurses, healthcare assistants phoning up patients. More effective than antidepressants, except for severe. So that's at six months. That's a pretty good number. Actually, no, none of the primary care antidepressant trials go for so long. So if we were completely rational, we'd probably start with the phone call. OK, so patients present with physical. Second visit, usually some improvement. Avoid drugs at the first visit. Big placebo response. Use the telephone. Helping depression is very satisfying. And this is Kirk Strosel. So he was one of the inventors of ACT. And he, and, uh, he developed FACT. There will be a, a, um, uh, a two-day seminar here. And you'll get an email about that. Um, there's a fee for that. If you're in counties, there'll be uh, one day on a Saturday, there'll be no fee, and there'll be a seminar, uh, a webinar on 7.30 on the 28th. So thank you very much.